we have talked about molecular shapes, all those funny words, and then some of the silly ones like seesaw. And we have talked about polar bonds. And now we're gonna put those two ideas together. So if we're thinking about a diatomic molecule where there are only two atoms, there's only one bond. And if that bond is polar, then the molecule is polar. So here we have hydrogen and chlorine. And these are two different nonmetals, and so I would expect you to tell me that this is a polar bond. Chlorine is more electronegative. When we look at the periodic table, we see that chlorine is right below fluorine, so quite electronegative. Hydrogen is way the heck on the other side. Did I tell you the little boys in the houses story? I don't think I did. Okay, so electrons are kind of unpredictable and squirrely, right? So they remind me a lot of my sons when they were little boys. You never know what they're gonna do, right? So I think of electrons as being little boys. And so this is uh, the home of the hydrogen family and this is the home of the chlorine family and they each have a son that's gonna go out and play. So these two boys are gonna go outside and play. And um, sometimes they're gonna go over and play in chlorine's house or yard, and sometimes they're gonna play in hydrogen's house or yard. Well, it turns out that you know hydrogen has a black and white television and a VHS player with some old Thomas the Tank Engine videotapes. And if you're hungry, you can have tap water and saltine crackers. And um, you know there's some dirt and a rusty swing in the backyard, right? This comes out every, different every single time. Um, over at Chlorine's house, they have a pool in the backyard, in-ground pool, with a diving board and a slide. And um, if you're hungry, mom will order pizza to be delivered. They have every kind of soda imaginable. They get all the channels, they have all the game systems. So these two little boys, where are they gonna spend more of their time? Chlorine. Chlorine, why? It's more attractive. Right? So electronegativity is how attractive is this atom for the electrons in a bond. So chlorine is more electronegative. It is more attractive to those electrons. So they're going to spend more time here. Let's look at this picture. And so if we look at the electron density, we're going to see that the electron density is bigger over here than it is over here. And so this side is a little bit negative and that side is a little bit positive. It's not ionic, there hasn't been a transfer of electrons, but those electrons pair, that pair of, of bonding electrons is spending more time over here. This arrow is another way to indicate the polarity of the bond. And so this is like, you know, somebody comes to the house and they say like, where is hydrogen junior? Um, and, it's like dad mowing the lawn and he, he's like pointing. He's over there. He's at Chlorine's house, right? So this is dad right here pointing to Chlorine's house. So that's where the electrons are spending more time. This is the negative end of the bond and this is the positive end. And see there's a little plus sign there. So that is a polar bond. It has a dipole moment. One end is positive, one end is negative. Any questions? Yes. So the, the hydrogen has um, a proton in its nucleus, right? And chlorine has a bunch of protons in its nucleus. And so if they spent, if they shared their time equally, then it would be a nonpolar bond. But they're not sharing equally, right? They're spending more time over here because it's nicer for them. They like it better, right? And so this end is partially negative and that end is partially positive. Okay, so like, for example, let's say we have calcium and we have the phosphorus, right? Mm -hmm. So calcium is, so are we looking at the size of the atom? Because We're looking at the difference in electronegativity. Oh, so like if we're going this way, that increases? Close, closer to, the one that's closer to fluorine Um, 
um, what we're looking at here is covalent bonds, so between nonmetals. So calcium and phosphorus, that would be an ionic compound. And so that's where the analogy gets a little weird because the electrons from calcium's house actually like just go and move in with phosphorus and they just stay over there, right? Um, Chlorine is closer to nit uh, fluorine. Fluorine is the most electronegative. Okay, and so these are periodic trends, and they they follow the same. All those trends, um, they either line up or they're exactly opposite of each other. Um, this one, I think, the easiest way to remember it is, fluorine's house is the ultimate kid paradise, right? And so if you've got two nonmetals, whichever one is closer to fluorine is going to be the negative end. There are some elements like carbon and sulfur that have the same electronegativity. They have a nonpolar bond. But I'm not going to ask you about those. Okay? The one that you need to remember is nonpolar is carbon-hydrogen. And that was kind of special because it's all over the place in OCHEM. Carbon-hydrogen is considered a nonpolar non bond. But if you have two other nonmetals that are different from each other, the electrons are not going to get shared equally. They're going to spend more time around one. And the one they spend more time around is more attractive to the electrons. It is more electronegative. OK? Any other questions? This is an important thing. So if we have a more complicated molecule than just two atoms, then things get a little more complicated. So the polarity of the whole molecule is going to depend on the geometry and on the kinds of bonds. So let's look at carbon dioxide. So here's a ball and stick model for carbon dioxide. We've got carbon in the middle and oxygen on each side. And there are no lone pairs on the carbon. There are two electron groups. So this is a linear molecule, right? We learned that from Vesper theory. Well, is a carbon-oxygen bond polar? Are those different nonmetals? Yes, they're different nonmetals. Yes, it's probably polar. Which is more electronegative? Which is closer to fluorine? Oxygen, right? So maybe oxygen doesn't have the diving board and the, the slide in their pool, but they have the pool, right? And so it's still a fun place for the electrons to hang out. So the shared electrons between carbon and oxygen are going to spend more time around oxygen. And there's the arrow, dad in the front yard pointed. They went that way. And here we have another bond like that. So the electrons here, we think of that as kind of, they're being pulled this way. So this is negative and that's positive. And here they're being pulled in the opposite direction. So we have two vectors. Dipole moments really are vector quantities. Now, some of you are like, ooh, cool. Vector quantities have direction and magnitude. The magnitude of these is the same because the elements are the same. The directions are exactly opposite. So in two dimensions, this is much easier than when we get into three dimensions. But it's like a number line. So if we have 0, 1, 2, and negative 1, and negative 2. And if we're adding plus 2 and negative 2, you get 0. Okay? That's vector addition. They're going in opposite directions, but they're equal in size, so they add up to 0. So two-dimensional vectors is a lot like just adding on a number line. The other thing you can think about is uh, tug-of-war. So this is the you know, official way. So you'd indicate the polar bonds with vectors pointing toward the more electronegative atom with a length that's proportional to the difference in electronegativity. And then you see if the polar bonds add together to give a net dipole moment or not. If the vector is summed to zero, the molecule is nonpolar. If there is a net vector, the molecule is polar. So I'm thinking that from about this point on, sounded like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. I don't break it, play me. Um, is this where I write it? 
Where is it? Um, oh, yeah, let's just talk about this right now. So this is my shortcut. We'll go back and very briefly talk about those other things. A molecule is nonpolar if both of these things are true. No lone pairs on the central atom and the atoms bonded to the central atom are the same or have the same electronegativity. So when we looked at carbon dioxide, are there any lone pairs on carbon? No. Are the atoms bonded to carbon the same? Yes. Both things are true. This is nonpolar. I explained it to you with the tug of war and stuff because I want you to see how it works in two dimensions so you can just believe me about the three dimensions. We look at water and we apply these rules. Are there lone pairs on the central atom? Yes. Yes. Done. Polar. Because what the lone pairs do is they make this lopsided. It is not perfectly symmetrical. It's going to be lopsided. So those are my shortcut rules. So let's go back here and at least talk through the um, other stuff. So when it says uh, in the parentheses, they'll have the same electronegativity, does that mean same polarness? Um, so like carbon and sulfur happen to have the same electronegativity. And so if, if you had one of those on one side and one on the other, they would be pulling equally strong. That would make the magnitude of the vectors be the same. But if you have, um, let's see. If you have a linear molecule where the two elements are different, that's not a good choice. No lone pairs on the central atom, but these are different, different electronegativities. This is going to be polar because it could be that this vector is going to be like minus one and this one's going to be plus three. Opposite directions, but one's bigger than the other. And so if I take minus one and add three, I end up with a positive two. They're not going to cancel each other out. Okay. So a molecule contains three identical polar bonds in a trigonal planar molecular geometry. Is the molecule polar? Well, let's draw that. So there's three polar bonds and the molecular geometry is trigonal planar. So are there any lone pairs on this central atom? If there was a lone pair here, then it would end up being like trigonal pyramid, right? It wouldn't be flat, right? So there's no lone pairs there. And so these are equally spaced out. The bonds are identical. So th these are the same elements. Same elements are bonded to the central atom, and there's no lone pairs. So my shortcut rules say this is nonpolar. But this is also a two-dimensional two problem. I guess the other one, the number line is actually one-dimensional, isn't it? So. Um, Here we've got three people. What are they fighting over? Big bag of candy, maybe. It's, you know, Halloween's coming up. So everybody wants the bag of candy, and so they're pulling on it. If they are equally strong, is that bag of candy going to move? No because they are exact, they're opposing each other, right? 
that would be vector addition. Those vectors would add up to zero. So is the molecule polar? No. No, it's not. So this is just, go through this real quick. One dimension, vector addition. So this is like uh, a number line. So here we have a plus five. So this has a length of five and it's going in the positive direction and a plus five. Um, you add those together and you get plus 10. Here you've got five going in the uh, left direction, negative, and 10 in the positive. You add those together, you get plus five. If you have the same magnitude, five and five, going in opposite directions, then those add up to zero. You believe that? Okay. And then we'll know that their numbers have been there as electrons, right? Pardon me? We'll know their numbers, their atom numbers have been there as electrons, right? Yeah, we're not actually going to be looking at the specific numbers, but the number would be related to the difference in electronegativity. Oh, okay. Yeah. So most of the time, we're going to see that the vectors have the same magnitude. Most of the time. Just direction. Yeah. So if we have two or more dimensions, um, the way you would add these is you make a parallelogram, and the sum of those is the diagonal of the parallelogram. May or may not make any sense. Three or more vectors. You add two of them first with the parallelogram, and then you take that one and you add it with the last one with the parallelogram. Um, I have yet to find a student who really enjoys that. So if we have a linear molecule, most of the time there's no lone pairs on the central atom. My rules don't work 100% of the time, probably about 95 but hey, that's pretty good. Um, if we have a bent molecule, well, usually it's bent because there's lone pairs on the central atom, and that makes this unsymmetrical now. Trigonal planar is three groups, no lone pairs. So no lone pairs. Tetrahedral comes from four groups, no lone pairs. Trigonal pyramid happens when we have four groups, but one of them is a lone pair. So there would be a lone pair up here, and so that one's polar, and this one's polar. These guys are all symmetrical. Okay, so those are my, that's my shortcut. Determine if CF4 is polar. We have to start with the Lewis structure. So we've got carbon and we've got four fluorines around it. And then those fluorines are going to have lone pairs. We don't really care about those lone pairs, but I'm going to put them on there. What we're interested in is the central atom. Are there any lone pairs on the central atom? No. Are the atoms bonded to the central atom the same? Yes. Nonpolar. What if we had, oh, let's do that. What if, instead of fluorine here, we had iodine? Oh, that's not what I meant to do. Are there any lone pairs in the central atom? No. Are all the atoms bonded to the central atom the same? No, because iodine is different than fluorine. Fluorine and iodine have different electronegativities, right? And so the magnitude of this polar bond is not the same as the magnitudes of the other polar bonds. So even though this molecule is symmetrical and each of these is pulling away from the carbon, three of them are pulling stronger than the fourth one. 
And so it's lopsided. So pull them off. It would be tetrahedral in shape, yes. But it would be polar. So if that's our oddball, maybe this is even less electronegative than carbon. And these guys are all pulling this way. So the vectors are going like that. And this one's coming out at you. And this one's going back behind. And then let's say this is less electronegative than the carbon. And so this one's actually going that way. Those are not going to add up to zero. So really, the lone pairs and the atoms being the same, that's, that's the best way, I think. So um, pol polarity of molecules matters a lot because it affects their properties. Um, so here we have models of water. So water molecules are polar. The hydrogen end is a little positive. The oxygen end is a little bit negative. And so those ends are attracted to each other, kind of like the opposite poles of magnets. So these guys are really attracted to each other. So oil is a nonpolar substance. It's just all carbon and hydrogen bonds. There's no positive or negative end. So we don't have the same kind of attraction between the molecules. But the water is polar, and it does have those attractions. And so the water really likes other water molecules, and they're just so tight with each other, they literally squeeze the oil out. The oil floats because it's less dense. There are other substances that are more dense than water that won't mix, and they'll just go to the bottom. It's a bit like if you had a bunch of magnetic marbles mixed with regular glass marbles. The magnetic marbles would all clump together, and the glass marbles would just be rolling around, right? Why? Well, the magnetic marbles are attracted to each other, and the glass marbles are not. So this has a big effect on whether substances mix with each other. Any questions? You probably know from experience that grease and oil don't rinse off with water. You get butter or Crisco on your hands, Rinse it with water, not coming off. You need soap, right? How does soap work? Water's polar, the grease or Crisco or butter is nonpolar. So soap molecules look something like this. They have this long tail of carbons and hydrogens. This is nonpolar. So this will interact well with the grease. And then they have one end that is polar. And this can interact with the water very well. So what happens is, let's see if I can draw this. So we've got our, now that's a bad start. Here's our, our polar head and our nonpolar tails. And right in here, this is our, our glob of grease. So the nonpolar tails of the soap will get in and mix around with that grease. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're like us. We like you. Oh, la, la, la. And on the outside of this, all the polar heads of the soap are sticking out in a sphere. It's called a micelle in a sphere. And these are polar. And the water's like, oh, hey, dude, yeah, come on in. And so what the soap does is it breaks the oil, butter, or grease into little tiny pieces, surrounds it with these soap molecules, and that allows the water to wash it away. Any questions? <laughs>